Let's get started. It's uh, actually a packed room. I think there's one seat open. There's over 50 people in here, which is kind of surprising. I imagine you know people are even or either here because they think this talk will be incredulous, you know, professional bash development, or they think it's you know going to be really serious. They're like, oh yeah, I'm going to do you know pro bash development too, and I need to go way beyond shell scripting. So. Just out of curiosity, you know, how many people are here because they, they think this talk is kind of incredulous, kind of weird, like, oh, that's a bunch of crap. You can't do pro development with Bash. You can be honest. It won't hurt my feelings. <laughs> OK, so one. What's that? OK. It is on. I can hear a slight bit from the speakers. Yeah. Can you hear it better now? Well, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let's see. How about that? That better? I could hold it through the whole. All right. I'll try to speak more loudly if that works. Perhaps if we move this closer. How's that? All right. Well, I could just, you know, give the presentation like this. <laughs> oh, really dramatic. And then in the end, right as I finish. <laughs> so, in any case, I'll, I'll... Okay. Well, in any case, so there was at least one person who's here because they think this is crazy. So I presume the rest of you all are here because you actually already do kind of, you know, serious bash development, professional bash development, is that the case? Yeah, I see. What's that? Semi-professional. Semi-professional? Oh, well, that's good. Well, then, I guess, uh, uh, get on my slides. I guess uh, my goal will be easy to obtain in this particular situation because my goal for this talk is to demonstrate that bash is a language that can be used to create professional programs. Uh, and the kind of secondary goal, but like I said, since it looks like a lot of you are already doing that, the secondary goal is to uh, have you develop professional programs in Bash. You know, maybe step up to that level uh, and, you know, not feel like you're crazy for doing so. Uh, and after, you know, this presentation and, you know, seeing what, you know, I do uh, at Percona, uh, I think you'll you'll feel that you're in good company. I guess maybe I should, you know, also say a quick blurb about myself. I don't like the who am I slides too much, but my name is Daniel Neister. Uh, I, my company is Test Noir. It's a quiet little startup, uh, but my day job is Percona. I imagine has anyone here ever heard of Percona, the MySQL consultants? Okay, so about half the people. Percona is a company that specializes in MySQL consulting and. That's my day job, my full-time job. And I do mostly Perl development there, but also PHP, and as you can imagine, a bunch of Bash development. So there's a quick background about me. So that's my goal. Why this goal? Well, frankly, because you know, I think it's interesting. Uh, I think it's a little bit weird doing full-blown professional programs in Bash. Um, there's also some other reasons for doing this, which is to counter the idea that you know, Bash is not for that. You know, sometimes when you're approaching a new project or a program, maybe a prototype or something, you think, oh, I'll do it in Bash. And maybe you just express that idea really quickly to someone else, and they're like, you're crazy. You don't use Bash for that. And you're like, you're right. And then you go back to using like Ruby or you know, Python or you know, some quote unquote serious language, Perl, whatever. So, you know, the other reason for this is to, to counter that idea that, you know, Bash is not for that. Well, maybe it could be for that. Uh, another reason is to, you know, perhaps if it's not too you know, lofty of a goal uh, or a reason, but to maybe open a, a new world of possibilities to you, you know, to show you really what you can achieve with Bash, uh, whether you think it's crazy or incredulous or not. You know, yes? Okay, I'll, 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 I'll mention something about that near the end. Mention a couple things, actually. So, yeah, so maybe open a, a new world, you know, of development to you. 
Uh, and then, you know, kind of a, a third or, you know, uh, kind of s reason for doing this is to kind of address maybe the, the, the stigma that scripting is inherently messy, that, you know, anytime you start to do bash, you know, what you're, it's just a process of creating sp spaghetti code and everything's a global variable and, you know, it's just one long line of, of procedures and it's inherently messy and you can't do anything, anything clean in it. So kind of to look at and address that stigma as well. So let's begin, uh, you know, not to get in some heated debate about this, but just a quick look at, you know, and a consideration of what is a script? Because bash and scripting are nearly synonymous. I mean, the phrase exists, you know, bash scripting. Uh, and as such, that kind of makes bash programming almost oxymoronic. You know, it's, it's you know, natural to say, oh, it's a bash script, or I'm doing bash scripting. But to say, oh, it's a bash program, you know, somehow that, that sounds or feels a little weird. It can be a C program, a C++ program. It can be a Perl program, Python program, but a bash program, eh. Well, well let's, let's take a look at this idea real quick. And I should make, you know, the preface that uh, my bachelor's degree is in philosophy, so. I have, an, I have an argumentative and uh, kind of a Western analytic tendency for these things, so I hope I'm not belaboring the point. So let's start off with this. Is, is this a script? You think? You, you, there could be audience participation. Yes? No? See? Some people are saying yes. Some people are saying no. All right. We, we, we don't have to decide this right now. I, I gotta <laughs> cut people. I'm gonna cut. I'm gonna cut people off because this is, you know, only 45 minutes. So, well, let me just ask one quick question. What's wrong with this? It's not a file. No. What's not optimal about it? There you go. Why not two commands? Yep. Useless use of a pipe. So, any case. So, well, is this a script then? Nah, it kind of seems even, even less like a script. That at least like had a couple of things going on. This is, quote unquote, purely just you're running a command, so it's, it's not really a script. Okay, so what about this? <laughs> eh, you know, now we're, we're kind of setting a variable and then using that variable, and is it a script though? Yes? A little more, a little more generic. Ah, so that, that's a good. So now we're, oh, see, now we're, now we're getting deep. So what's wrong with this? Again, kind of an optimal. It's probably there's a, a hidden bug in here. Smart quotes. Smart quotes. What do you mean? Who said that? Oh, that's just because of my font in, in the presentation. <laughs> I'm talking, you know, how, how might this bite you? Uh, if, instead of Yeti, you put like Yeti dog, uh, it would probably break the replicate Correct. So animal isn't quoted, and since that get, gets expanded when you actually run it, it would become grep Yeti dog, as in two words, and then dog would be interpreted as a file or something, or potentially a command to grep. So anyway, so yeah, so that's, that's what you should do. So see, we're already, you know, getting into to complexities and nuances, which also seem kind of oxymoronic when you're talking about, oh, it's just, it's just scripting. Well, scripting, you know, has subtleties just like any programming language. So what about this? Is this a, a script? Yes. Yeah. Presuming this is like in a, in a file. Yeah. Oh, yep. See, there's a typo. So that's that's a sorry. It's not a comment. That's supposed to be a shebang. So pretty much everyone agrees now that this is a script. And why is that? Oh uh, well, strictly speaking, you know, that's a form of input. Yeah, I guess maybe not a parameter, but an input. So I think the feeling here is that this is a script because it's in a file now. Okay. So, 
Okay. Yeah. Cool. Okay, okay. Well, that, that's good. I, I figured people would say that or, or feel that, so we'll return to that here in a bit. Remember, you know, Western analytic philosophy, picking on details, necessary and sufficient conditions for a definition of things. So, this is script? Yeah, it's getting a lot closer. I mean, now you have a function. This function has a, a parameter. You're calling it. Again, I missed the, the shebang. Oh, well. So... Oh, see, now, now you're debugging. <laughs> Jeez. I, I'm not saying this is perfect. These are, you know, these are for presentation, you know. Just imagining this stuff off the top of my head. So, so now we're, we're getting deeper. You know, you can go from this, which is pretty simple, and as people have, you know, debugged my slide, uh, <laughs> syntactically not correct in certain ways, but, you know, now we can get deeper in, and this isn't, I know this is going to be difficult to read. Um, that's not the point. So we can get deeper and start doing more things like, oh, well, you know, there's that shift and whatnot. And now we're doing a loop over all the files given on the command line and then running that function for all the files. We've set some, maybe you call them pragmas. You know, that'd be like in Perl, use strict, use warnings, for example. So this is, you know, looking more and more like a script, but also kind of more and more like a program. And we can, you know, still go deeper and do more. And now we can do some, you know, like uh, command line verification uh, or, you know, input validation. You know, if it's not a file, then die and say it's not a file. And so it's, you know, getting deeper and more complex. And we can even keep going on. And, you know, now it's getting even more deep and more complex. And now we're, you know, making sure that the command line usage is okay. And if not, printing a message. And, Oh, now down here, we're actually, uh, you know, piping something into awk and, you know, printing only the first field of whatever matches, et cetera. You and your I did? Yeah, you yeah. Oh, wow. And your quotes. Oh, well, see, there you go. Change from shell to match. Yeah. <laughs> see, this is one perceptive audience. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> like 2.30, you're supposed to be asleep or something. <laughs> right after lunch. Well... So, well, the, the, the error is notwithstanding. Yeah. I, I think this begins to at least demonstrate to some degree that this idea of what is a script um, is, a, is a fuzzy issue. You know, at what point does something go from being running a single command to running two commands that are piped together to it being a script to it being a full-blown program? So, you know, there's a saying, one man's trash is another man's treasure. Well, we might say that one man's script is another man's program. You know, you might look at something and say, ah, that's just a script because he's using bash and, you know, there's pipes and things like that. But you know, that can actually be a full-blown program. And if you didn't look under the hood, so to speak, if you didn't know it was bash and you were just running this program, then you might say it's a program. So the point I'm trying to make in this kind of part of the talk is that, you know, the definition of a script is not is not simple, uh, and as we saw, you know, from the audience, you know, disagreeing and agreeing at certain times, and these kind of you know ideas about when it becomes a script. To return to that, um, the idea that you know, we came across earlier, it became a script when we put it in a file. Well, you know, that that point could be belabored because okay, you're saying that this is a script. It becomes a script when we put it in a file. Well, then my argument would be, okay, anything I put in a file is a script. You say, well, no, that's, that's not the case. It has to be bash code that you put in a file, and it has to have that shebang line so the command interpreter knows what to run, et cetera, et cetera. So now the definition is getting more and more complex and nuanced. So it's not a script just because you put it in a file. So I know this is belaboring a point, but it's just to get you to, to think about this. And furthermore, we could you know, argue the point well, what's the criteria by which we're deciding this in the first place? Because like I just said, if your criteria is, it's a script when you put it in a file, well, then I say my counter argument is, well, then put in anything in a file. And is it a script? And you say, well, no. So then you have to establish your criteria. And you know, here's a list of you know, some other criteria and considerations about what a, is it a script? Is it a program? You know, is a bunch of commands glued together? a script 
Well, in, in scripts, so to speak, bash scripts, we tend to have a lot of commands glued together. But, you know, I could open Perl and do the exact same thing in Perl, but maybe you wouldn't call it a script then. And then we get into questions about, you know, syntax and semantics, the use of functions and variables and things. Sure, bash is not an object-oriented language, but you know, I, I'm pretty sure you would say that that doesn't preclude it from, you know, being able to, to produce programs. Length and complexity, you know, sometimes people think, oh, if it's just a, a few couple lines and whatnot, it's a script, not a program. Well, that's really kind of arbitrary, too. I mean, what, what, why does that criteria matter? Purpose, usefulness, longevity. Well, maybe something to you is a program, even if it's really short, uh, really simple, just, you know, glue some commands together. But this is the program that, I don't know, rotates or incremental backup files on your, your server or something. You know, the development model we apply to it. And then finally, kind of like the language itself, I think is, is something that pops up in people's head when they're thinking about, you know, is this, a, is this just a script or is, is this a program? They, they look at the language. That's why I gave the example like, you know, if you were running this program and you didn't know it was Bash, and you say, oh, this is a great program, then you find out it's written in Bash, and you're like, ah, it's just a script. Well, so there's, there's this, this contention on the language itself. And so that leads me to ask the question, you know, is Bash, Bash a language? Well, by definition, no, it's not a language. By definition, it's a shell. It's the born-again shell, as you know, we probably all know. What's that? It's an interpreter. Yeah, see, now, again, now we're going to start splitting hairs. It's an interpreter, it's a shell. Uh, so, again, this, you know, just feeds into the point. Is it a language? Well, again, by definition, it's a shell, it's an interpreter. Um, you know, there's also the, the classic O'Reilly book, um, classic shell scripting. Again, we, he, we see here um, this kind of blending of bash, uh, you know, this talks about other shells. But bash and shells in scripting, it kind of makes them synonymous. So I'm not criticizing this book in any sense. I'm just saying, you know, for books and reasons like this, we kind of get this idea in our head that bash and scripting are synonymous, and therefore bash and program are kind of oxymoronic. So, you know, at this point, I think uh, any definition would be, you know, a hard point to argue for, and we're certainly not going to arrive at anything and. 45 minutes or even, you know, even a decade. I actually, you know, studied philosophy for 10 years. Not that I was an undergraduate for 10 years, but even after my undergraduate, I did a master's and still attended philosophy classes and stuff. So I can tell you, even after 10 years of philosophy, you don't come up with answers. So we're not going to come up with answers here. So let me, let me, let me do what, like a gut check. So if bash is not a language, per se, then what is this? Yeah, looks a lot like something that you would see in a, in a true quote-unquote language to me. You know, I have a function definition, and then you have a locally scoped variable. Yeah, it looks very language-like. And of course, I shouldn't say of course, perhaps there's someone in here that is not really familiar with bash. This is a function definition in Bash. Now, what's interesting, what's this? Pearl. Oh, yes. Strictly speaking, it's a slide. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so if Bash isn't a language, then what's that? Mm, OK. And then what's that? Well, that's Perl. That's a Perl function definition. Pretty much identical, just the uh, syntax has changed a little bit, but the semantics are the exact same. And then going on again, what's this? This is not a trick question anymore. Which language is this? Python. Yeah, Python. So there's a remarkable similarity in Bash, this supposed non-language that's only good for scripting and can't be used to make professional programs, and these other languages that look dramatically similar and also in a lot of respects, functions similarly. So the answer, I think, and you know, classic philosophical answer, yes and no. You know, it's, mm, it's strictly speaking a shell, but it's a shell, but it's also kind of a language. If you don't believe that, then you have to you know, answer this, this question, then what is that? 
Uh, and of course, it's also glue to a certain extent, um, which means that you know it can glue together you know, a lot of system commands and, and other programs. But as I mentioned earlier, so you can do the same in any other language. You can glue things together all day long. So Bash is several things to be sure. But what I find unique about Bash, among the things that it is, it is deeply time-tested, field-tested, and real-world proven. In other words, it's pretty old and pretty established. I don't know when, you know, I know that uh, the current version of Bash, I think is like four or five, but Bash version three is usually the kind of baseline for modern things, and that came out maybe in the 80s, some of the older programmers in here. Bash is at least, what, 20 years old, I think? Yeah, people nodding their heads. What's that? Yeah. yeah, so I mean that's, yeah, I mean Corn Shell goes back to what, 70s? Yeah. 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 See. So you know, talk about you know being really proven, uh, and it's almost universal. I've never met a person, you know, in the computing kind of programming world, of course, and even the, like the database administration world, sysadmin world. It seems like you can't grow up in in the IT world without coming across some sort of you know bash, bash scripting, whatever you want to call it. Even if it's just as simple as, you know, piping two commands together, whether you know it or not, that's the kind of, you know, inkling, the seed of, you know, learning the bash language, whether you realize that it's a, a language, whether you agree that it's a language. I think it's a language, but. So, it really doesn't matter if bash is a language proper or not. You know, we can still you know, move forward with, for one, this presentation, two, uh, development with it. So that question aside for the moment, these kind of philosophical questions aside for the moment, let's just say, okay, if Bash were a language, what should it have? You know, what do real languages have, so to speak? I mean, at, a, at the most fundamental level. I don't want to get into like an argument about it. it's not a real language unless it has meta object programming or something like that or unless it has a real thread implementation or something like that. I think at the, the basic level, there's at least two things. Libraries and testing. Uh, I'll get to the third here in a second. You know, libraries, I mean this in a very, very broad sense. I'm talking about some sort of way to create small units, packages of code that are reusable so you don't have to keep you know, copying and pasting and, and rewriting stuff. So some sort of semblance of like libraries. Uh, other languages make that very explicit. You know, Perl has Perl modules, for example. I mean, it's just very, you know, in C libraries and all these other kind of things, it's very explicit. Here's a language, here's its libraries, et cetera. That's less clear in Bash, um, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't exist and it doesn't mean that you can't do it. Testing is even more nebulous in Bash. Um, you know, frankly, until I started testing my Bash programs, I had never seen or heard any, anyone else do it. And I'll, and I'll show you if you don't believe that it can be done. And then third is a coolness factor. Whether you like it or not, there's some people who argue you know, that certain languages are not languages anymore because no one, no one programs in them anymore. Bash is old, it's not cool. You know, ah, you can't make a program in Bash. So we'll, we'll have something to say about that here later. So first, let's look at this, this idea of Bash libraries. And now we're going to get into the kind of you know, meat of it where you can see you know, really what can be done with Bash and how it's done. And I'm not going like, to go through and do like, programming exercises and show you how to do this and that, because all this stuff is online. So just after the talk, you can go and it's all there. It's in Percona Toolkit. You can see it. You can even copy it and use all this stuff for your own project if you want. So I'm not going to try to do like, you know, technical demonstration. So speaking of Percona Toolkit, which is a free open source uh, collection of uh, MySQL tools written in Perl. Uh, well, written in Perl. There's actually several that are completely written in Bash. And that's why here we have a listing of our various Bash libraries. 
because it is possible to create bash libraries. And I'll show you what that looks like. And it's probably going to be underwhelming, but that's probably good in a certain sense because then you'll be like, oh, well, geez, I can do that too. Uh, um, bash libraries, yeah, why not? So let me switch over to my terminal here. So right now we're in the Percona Toolkit 2.2 slash lib slash bash. And there are those, those libraries that I told you about. So we'll just take a look at a really, really simple library here. Let me scroll up. So this is a bash library. All it is is a collection of bash functions. And for good measure, just kind of like in Perl, Perl has, you know, use strict, use warnings. Bash has this uh, dash u, which means die, bail out if there's any, uh, if you try to use a variable that's undefined. So all this is, is a, is a little file, a bash file, with a collection of bash subroutines. Uh, in this particular case, why would we be rewriting the uh, sequence command, which is a standard Unix command? Well, as it turns out, there's a lot of Unix systems that don't have standard commands, including like sequence and other things. So you know, this isn't whether you agree with us redoing this or not. It's just to demonstrate that here's a bash library that's alternate commands that we use for systems that are lacking these commands. Again, some systems don't have pid of, and so we just re-implemented pid of in this bash library that we use. Again, some systems don't have ls off, uh, so we re-implemented in this bash library, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, some systems also have a witch, which is uh, non-standard or does weird things. And so we re-implemented in this library. Again, don't worry about like copying this down or seeing you know, the syntax or if I'm doing anything special. This is all online. It's Percona Toolkit. It's on Launchpad. I'll have a link later. You can download it and see all the examples. So let me take a look at uh, another, what I think is a cool one. So we have this library called Safeguards. Uh, right now it only does two things. So our bash programs try to be really safe uh, when they run. And one of the things they do is they check disk space. And if the disk space is getting low, if uh, less than 5% free or less than 100 megabytes free, uh, it, it returns you know, your standard Unix one for you know, there's a problem, stop working. And since we have multiple programs that do this, and it's really kind of a nice, well-encapsulated idea, you know, safeguards, check the disk. So we created a bash library called safeguards, and we put it in there. And we developed things in a nice, you know, kind of factored out, modular way. So we have this one bash function that gets the disk space using, of course, df. And then the other function, oh, wow, it's even documented. It's, that's amazing. Uh, yeah. So we have this other, this other function that you, know, you call disk space, you get your disk space, and then you take the output from that and you put it into this check disk space function and it you know, chops it up and looks at it and you know, based on all the parameters you pass it, which are right here, if the disk space is low, then it returns one. So you know, this is pretty underwhelming stuff, like I said. It's just a library. It has uh, functions. These functions you know, are logically grouped together. And, you know, we have a whole bunch of them. Uh, we have another one like, I like this one, uh, subshell. So again, our bash programs tend to uh, fork off uh, child processes to do various tasks, and sometimes it'll background them so the main uh, process can keep running. Well, then when the main process finishes, it wants to wait for all those subshells, those subprocesses, give them a little while to finish up, but then if they don't finish up, then start killing them. So again, a kind of nice, well-encapsulated idea that we put in its own little library. So this is, you know, wait for subshells. And you tell it how long to wait, and it uses standard Unix commands to, you know, like jobs, to find out what are its jobs and child processes, parses stuff, waits for it. Uh, if after a while uh, its subshells don't exit on their own, then we have kill all subshells. So again, this isn't, I'm not here to like amaze you with, you know, you know, my bash programming skills or whatnot. I'm here to actually show you that it, it's super simple and it's really just as simple as that. So, you know, we have all these various bash libraries with, 
you know, kind of logically named files and the .sh extension, you know, just so it's clear that it's, you know, bash code because, you know, Perl modules have, will have a dot, a dot .pm extension, et cetera. So, you know, again, I won't go through all these files, you know, because this isn't just a complete show and tell. If you want to, you know, take a look at Percona Toolkit, you can you know, get it on Launchpad. Uh, in fact, now that I'm thinking about it, you have to get it on Launchpad because if you just download Percona Toolkit, we, we strip out all these libraries because we fat pack all the programs. So the libraries are stuffed inside the actual program itself. So to actually see these, you have to go to Launchpad, and I'll have a link later, and then you can access you know, whatever you put your branch in will be slash lib slash bash. And then you can see all these and get examples and inspiration. So, so I think that's, uh, you know, well, in my opinion, puts to rest the, the argument, well, oh, bash can't have libraries. It most certainly can have libraries. But, and I'm sorry this doesn't come up better, but, uh, does anyone here do a really good Darth Vader? Yeah, someone want to do it? No, no. Well, at the bottom it says, I find your lack of testing disturbing, or I find your lack of tests disturbing. So it's great, you know, to have libraries and whatnot, but, you know, the other part of, uh, you know, Bash being a, a full-blown official program, so to speak, is the ability to test. Uh, real unit tests, integration tests, uh, automated tests with a sort of with a test framework, uh, particularly including those libraries because you know it's part of the reason why you put something in a nice self-contained package library is then it makes it nice and easy to test. So, just uh, out of curiosity, before I go through this process, uh, who here tests their Bash programs? One, two. Just two. Does it count if I run them and see if they break everything? <laughs> yeah, that's a form of testing. Oh, well, that nice. oh okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, it's nice to see that people are at least running their programs, you know, to see if they break <laughs> stuff, uh, sending them out into the world. Because uh, there, are, there are people that uh, their testing is uh, users using it. You know, through, like I said, my, my little startup test noir, I, I talk with a lot of companies and I've come across a few, they say, oh, testing is users using it. It's like, well, okay. Hopefully they, they don't run into really bad problems. But so, yeah, formal testing of Bash, uh, I think uh, was nearly, you know, well, non-existent. I mean, I looked, I didn't find anything. Maybe I just didn't look in the right places. But before you know, I created this, this test framework, if you want to call it that, I didn't see any other way to kind of unit test bash libraries, particularly the ones I just showed you. And so I concocted this method. And it may seem crazy, but damn it, it works. And uh, again, well, let me just show you something. Uh, let's see here. So let me actually do this. So Perl parse options.t looks like you know standard Perl stuff. Looks like standard Perl stuff. You know, that's, in fact, that's uh, tap valid output. Uh, for those of you who aren't Perl programmers, Perl uses a, a particular test framework that uses this uh, protocol called test anything protocol, tap. And this is the output that it puts out. If a test fails, it just says not OK, and then the number, et cetera. So it's nothing like the uh, X unit or J unit uh, test frameworks. It's more simple like this. So if you didn't know, you would say, oh, that's a Perl you know, module being tested. Uh, but in fact, it's bash. And this is no you know, easy or, or simple feat. It's quite the amalgamation of, of technologies. But you know, we've been using it for over a year now. And it's never really had a problem. And I've almost recreated all of uh, Perl's uh, test, harned, test harness methods recreated or simulated in Bash, things like OK, is, uh, like, etc. So going back to my slide real quick, 
know, this is uh, achieved through various uh, steps of magic, which again, I'm not gonna go through it in, in great detail here. I'll just kind of uh, demonstrate it so you can kind of get an idea of what it's doing. Again, if you uh, check out uh, the Percona Toolkit branch, you can see all of this in there and then kind of look through it yourself. So let me go back here and let's actually first look at one thing. So you'll notice that everything has a duplicate. So I'm going to use this alt commands again. There's an alt commands.sh and an alt commands.t. It's the alt commands.t that we run just, you know, to keep things simple because most of the project is Perl, so most of the tests are .t, so we do that. But look at this weirdness. So the alt commands.t is actually a symlink to this other bash program. And let's just look at that real quick. And again, oh, looks like I already have it open. Again, I'm not going to go through it all because this is actually pretty extensive. It takes a lot of bash to, to simulate uh, you know, Perl's test, uh, test harness and test framework in bash. But what we have here, and look, I even you know, have nice sections of stuff. So let me show you the more interesting stuff. So uh, here we go. So here we have kind of Perl standard uh, test uh, framework, te uh, test harness calls like like. Uh, no diff is not in Perl, but it makes sense in Bash. Is, you know, is one variable equal to another? And then other kind of more, you know, Bash specific things like file is empty, file contains, command OK, dies OK, uh, and then some various helper functions. There's even a diag command. Perl, uh, Perl's uh, test framework has this command called diag, which if your test fails, then use diag to print diagnostic information. So again, if you didn't know that this was all bash, you would swear it was Perl. And again, I'm not going to go through the magic of all this uh, at a technical level, just kind of a higher level overview. So what's happening, this first step, we run Perl.t. And what that actually does, you saw that symlink. What that actually does is it loads this test bash function, that big file I just scrolled through. What that actually does is it looks at the original file, so let's say that was lib.t or alt commands.t in my example. It chops off that .t because it knows that it's a bash test framework. Then it appends .sh, or so let's see. So it appends dot, dot sh, and then it sources that. Uh, it kind of imports it, uh, would be the translation into other languages. It imports this, which is the actual test itself, you know, written in Bash. And then the test starts running and calling these other things from the program that just imported it. So I know it's a little, you know, difficult to follow. That's why I'm only doing a very you know, high level overview. But the, the point is, is that it works. And you know, for as, in and so far as Bash permits, it looks a lot like Perl's test framework. I used Perl because Perl is simple. I know Perl best. And if anyone could do an X unit test framework in Bash, I will be truly impressed. Uh, and Perl just works for it. So you don't have to declare how plan is how many tests you're about to do in Perl. You don't have to do that. Uh, and then you just start doing stuff in Bash. You know, like we run a command here in Bash, you know, put its output to a file, and then we use no diff to see, you know, is the output that we got, this line right here, is the output that we got any different from, or in other words, is the output equal to the, what we were expecting? If it is, then, you know, this little message prints either, you know, one okay or one not okay. And like I said, I know there's a, a lot of details that I'm skipping over, but the end result is that it just works. You know, and you can do a lot of testing on it. All those tests are running through this, this system I concocted. And so you know, this is 
Uh, it's a bit much to digest. The point here is just, again, going back to those three things. Libraries, you know, we looked at that. You can definitely have libraries. They're really easy. Testing, you can definitely have testing. You can test those libraries. You can even do integration testing, like test the entire program that has libraries inside it. I didn't show it here for uh, time constraints. But now you can test those libraries and test the programs. Again, if you want to see a lot of examples of this, look at Percona Toolkit. So that addresses two of those three things. The last one is this, this coolness factor. You know, and it strikes me, the reason why I have a, uh, a Camaro up here is not because I'm some huge Camaro fan, but this is a, a 2013 Camaro. You know, some people say, you know, Bash is old. It, it's, it's not useful anymore. You can't make programs with it. I think we just dispelled the argument that you can't have libraries. You certainly can. Dispel the argument that you can't do real formal testing. You can, they, and then they may recourse to, well, it's old, you know. Well, you know, some people like classics. You know, some people think that, you know, Camaros from 20 years ago were the best Camaros, and that's the only true Camaro. And then some people prefer new things. So, you know, this, this idea that it's old, I think, is really kind of a, a non-starter. It's not a good argument. You know, in my opinion, we can just say that Bash, kind of like a Camaro or a Corvette, is timeless. There's a reason why it's been around for 30 some odd years. It's probably still going to be with us, you know, 20 more years. And furthermore, you know, if you really start to harness, ba harness Bash, you can do a lot of cool things in it. Uh, let me give you one example before we wrap up here. So uh, this is uh, one of the Percona Toolkit tools, uh, PT Summary. I'm not going to explain it. But what it does is it summarizes uh, your basic system information. So here we tell, it's telling us stuff about the release, uh, the kernel, the system architecture, et cetera, et cetera. It has in, the, in this nice kind of, you know, columnized out, uh, output, and on and on it goes. And we have more complex programs like PT Stock, uh, which sits around and waits for your MySQL server to have a problem, then it starts collecting data. And and again, if you didn't know, so dash dash help. If you didn't know, that sure looks like a normal program to me. It has a dash dash help, you know, it gives you some information about the command line options. It tells you what the, the defaults are for those options right now. This entire program is written in Bash. In fact, over 2,000 lines of Bash. It doesn't matter that it's written in Bash. This is a full-blown, professional-grade program that's you know, been in the field for years. It's integration tested. It's unit tested. It just goes to show that you can do a lot of cool things with Bash. So professional programs in Bash? I think absolutely. You, know, you can have libraries. You can have reusable code. You can have you know, unit tests and integration tests. Uh, you have standard language semantics, you know, like uh, locally scoped variables and things. Maybe not object-oriented program, but you don't need that all the time. And you can do really cool and useful things. So uh, two really uh, important links. Uh, the slides will be made available later. So the first is this advanced bash scripting guide. There again, we see that, you know, the synonymous bash and scripting, whatever. This is uh, the Advanced Bash Scripting Guide Online is a great resource uh, for you, sir, who was asking about resources. Pretty much anything you need to know about Bash scripting, Bash programming, uh, this website's awesome. And then Percona Toolkit, uh, lots of examples of massive use of Bash development, Bash programming for professional programs. You know, these are programs that Percona supports, that we run on mission critical systems, that we test. And so it's just a really good example. So thank you.